seventh session for the pediatric orthopedic fellows. And in this session, we are going to discuss the management of crouch. But before that, uh, we will understand uh, definition of crouch, the etiology or the causes of crouch, and then uh, we will come to the various aspects of management. So let's start uh, with a very simple question. Uh, fellows, this is a question for you. There is one international conference is going on and the speaker is speaking about what is crouch gate. So in that, he says that the crouch gate is a gate in which knee remains flex in the stand space. Again, I repeat, the crouch gate is a gate in which knee remains flex in the stand space. So now the question I want you to answer, whether you agree with this statement or you don't agree with this statement. Thank you. Thank you. Partially agree, sir. Partially agree. Okay. I agree, sir. Agree. Okay. Good. Yeah. Be quick. Agree. Agree. Okay. Anyone else? I also agree, sir. Okay. Good. So let's go further. I am now adding one more option to that. And that option is. Option A, I agree. Option B, I don't agree. And option C, which I have added, that this is an incomplete statement. The statement which uh, uh, we heard previously, that crouch gate is a gate in which the knee remains in stance phase. So what is your opinion about that? So not, not on. Incomplete definition. It's incomplete definition. Can anyone uh, would like to uh, complete that? Sorry, sorry, sorry for that. Yeah. Alur, can sir, you please mute yourself? Yes. So, yeah. Uh, can you uh, complete the se uh, sentence or like can you add on to what uh, or why do you feel that this is incomplete? <laughs> because it doesn't address the ankle uh, position because in crouch ankle has to be in dorsiflexion. Very so good. Yes, so that's very important that it's not only the knee, but it's ankle also, which is very important. Very good. So let's see some of the videos and then I will ask you whether it's a crouch gate or not. I already shared these videos with you so that uh, in Zoom, uh, there was one complaint that we are not able to see video very smoothly. And that's why I'm, um, I already shared these videos with you. So let's go uh, with that, the first video. So the question is, is it a crouch gate? It's a, not a crouch gate. Why? Because the ankle is in uh, plantar flexion. It's not dorsiflexed. It's okay, jumping. good. So uh, you say that uh, this is not crouch gate. Very good. So let's move further. So if you look at this gate, the knee is flexed, but ankle is in plantar flexion. And when knee is in flexion, but ankle is in plantar flexion, we call it a jump knee gait. So this was an example of jump knee gait. Okay, let's see this video. Already we have seen this video last time. And uh, I would like you to say which type of gait this is. This is a crouch gait, but the heel is off because of the midfoot break. Okay, right. Sir, it's, it's an apparent, apparent equinus gate. It's apparent equinus gate. We discussed last time that when knee is flexed, but if ankle is in neutral, we don't call it crouch or we don't call it jump knee gate and we call it apparent equinus gate. So that was an example of apparent equinus gate. Now coming to the third gate, what about this? This is crouch, sir. Crouch gate. This is crouch. This is crouch. Yes. No. Controversy, no confusion. The knee is in flexion and ankle is in dorsiflexion. And that's why we call it crouch gait. So in definition of crouch gait, it's very important that both knee flexion and ankle in dorsiflexion are prerequisite. Okay, let's review a few more videos. I want you to say whether that's a crouch or not.
it's a crouch it's a crouch good let's go on to the fifth video not a crouch it's not a crouch okay because ankle is definitely in plantar flexion very good it is jump kick it's a jump knee gait very good the next video is in a slow motion basically because uh, sometimes at normal speed it is very difficult for us to understand so i have converted this video into slow motion and we are going to play this video so i want you to comment on this It's a crouch. It's, it's a crouch gait. Good. Anyone would like to say something different? Sir, uh, it's it's not looking like a crouch because but the child is landing with the uh, ankle in neutral. Uh, yes. It's a mixed pattern, sir. Type five. Wonderful. Who answered that? Can you can it's you tell me your name? Devendra sir. Uh, Devendra, wonderful. This is a very typical asymmetrical gait pattern in which the left lower limb is in crouch, but right is in apparent equinus. Very good. So that's what we want to emphasize that not all the gait with a knee flexion, they are crouch. Either it could be a jump knee gait, it could be apparent equinus, or it could be a real crouch. So that was the message we wanted to discuss. Okay, now we come to a most important point, and that is how do we remain upright? That's the question we want to understand. We say that the human has a bipedal gait and we have an upright posture. So from four leg animal, we have become a bipedal and we have an upright posture. So now the question is that how we remain upright? Because of the anti-gravity muscles. Because of the anti-gravity muscles. Very good. So which are the anti-gravity muscles? The gluteus, quadriceps, soleus. Right. So these are the three muscles, the soleus, quadriceps, and the hip extensors or the gluteus maximus. These are the three anti-gravity muscles. Now, the simple understanding is ineffectiveness of these muscles due to various reasons, either maybe weakness, or because of the lever arm problem, the, these muscles, one or more muscles, they are not able to function effectively. And that results into crouch gait. So crouch gait in short is something like this. Because of the problem at the soleus or at the quadricep or at the hip extensors, that's a gluteus maximus. So now the most important question is that why do these muscles become ineffective in some of the patient with cerebral palsy? That is what we are going to discuss. We know some reasons and we have identified uh, that how we are going to discuss that. And so now I invite uh, first Vikas uh, to discuss about the foot deformity and how it is responsible for that. Yeah, you can start sharing because yes sir. because it's from cmc below is my slide visible sir yes yeah just go to the full screen uh, is it visible sir yes yeah, yeah. respected teachers and my dear colleagues uh, greetings to all of you my presentation uh, today is on plain valgus foot deformity causing crouch key as we all know, crouch gait uh, results from a muscular imbalance involving the hamstrings or the gastrocnemius contraction, coupled with the ankle plantar flexor weakness. This results in an alteration of the ground reaction force vector, being more posterior to the knee, which generates a flexion knee moment and uh, results in increased demand of the quadriceps. This makes the knee to remain in flexion throughout stance phase. Deformity of the foot in children with cerebral palsy is usually the result of a dynamic imbalance between the extrinsic muscles of the calf that control the segmental foot and ankle alignment. These imbalances result in very three common coupled uh, 
foot and ankle segmental manualin patterns in children especially in children with spastic type of cerebral palsy these are equinus deformity equino cavo virus deformity and an equino plano valgus deformity the third type the equino plano valgus deformity is discussed here this is characterized by an equinus deformity of the hind foot coupled with pronation deformities of the midfoot and the forefoot the lateral column of the foot is initially functionally shorter than the medial column and with age with increasing age it becomes structurally short this equino plano valgus malalignment maintains the midfoot and the forefoot segments in an unlocked alignment hence compromising the stability function in mid stance which results in excessive loading of the plantar medial portion of the midfoot and also with this deformity the moment generating capacity of the plantar plantar flexors especially the soleus is further compromised by this malalignment of the midfoot and forefoot segments which effectively shortens the liver arm available for this soleus uh, during the third rocker uh, this is a diagram that shows the function of the soleus so we can see that the soleus is the muscle which pulls the tibia backward during stance but for this soleus to act effectively it needs a solid anchor or a base which is provided by a normal foot so the sagittal length of the foot in a normal foot the heel bisector usually goes to the second toe so that provides a sufficient sagittal length of the foot giving stability for the soleus to pull the tibia backward during stance during a plano valgus deformity this anchor on which the soleus acts uh, is deficient hence the soleus gradually weakens and uh, the less it pulls it pulls the tibia less the tibia goes forward uh, resulting in a flexion of the knee resulting in a crouch gait an analogy that i could relate to was uh, these two cranes they can be taken as the right foot uh, the crane on the left side uh, can be uh, viewed as a plano valgus foot whereas the crane on the right side is a normal foot physics will convince us that the crane on the right side uh, will uh, lift more load so the wheels of the crane can be related to the foot whereas the pulling pulling system of the crane can be related to the soleus and in addition to these uh, deformities uh, increased external tibial torsion is also seen which may be associated with the equinoplano valgus segmental malalignment and it uh, it contributes to an external foot progression angle further compromising the liver arm available to the ankle plantar flexor in terminal stance hence to summarize uh, briefly the plano valgus foot deformity involves a combination of equinus talonavicular joint dislocation or called a midfoot break and an external tibial torsion which leads to an imbalance and eventually liver arm dysfunction which contributes to crouch gait these were my references thank you yeah thank you for explaining the uh, concept of plano valgus foot now i would like to ask you one important question that why in children with cerebral palsy the plano valgus foot deformity develops what is the reason you describe the biomechanics after the deformity develops but let's go back and understand that what is the reason of uh, the development of this deformity so children start uh, with an equinus gait uh, with time uh, they develop a midfoot break and then this midfoot break predisposes the foot uh, to develop to get a plano valgus deformity so it starts with an equinus added upon is the midfoot break and eventually the plano valgus deformity ensues very good uh, i would like to ask benjamin like what is the mechanism of plano valgus foot deformity is it the only thing or in addition to that peronia also are also playing some role in that when there is an equinus and the heel is off the ground there is a, an attempt to bring the heel down and the mechanisms that may work is the hind foot going into valgus whenever there is an equinus to get the heel down you have the subtalar i mean the joint and and the and the midfoot to go into a valgus position and then the heel can rest on the ground provided the valgus is maintained you correct the valgus the heel goes up so one of the compensatory mechanism for the equinus is the, is the development of a valgus deformity and that will over time become rigid so either 
it succeeds or goes into a midfoot break where the heel stays off the ground, only the forefoot is in contact with the ground. If it succeeds in, and swings into valgus, you get in the foot flat on the ground, but it, the hind foot is in valgus. Uh, I would uh, recommend you to read uh, the recent article published by uh, Dr. Benjamin in Journal of uh, Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America. That's about the foot biomechanics. And in that, uh, he has shown really well that how a short tendo Achilles leads to vulgus. So it's a short tendo Achilles which leads to vulgus, which, is the, which are the changes which is taking place at the hind foot. And in addition to that, something is happening at the midfoot, which results into midfoot break. So uh, do you consider, uh, Dr. Benjamin, do you consider that it's a hind foot, which is the initiation of the, or initiator of the deformity, which leads to midfoot break? I, th I think it is. I think it, it, it's uh, the equinus component. You've got a tight gastrosodius, and that drives both the midfoot break as well as the valgus deformity of the hind foot. Okay, so in that case, uh, the release of gastrosolius early will help us in preventing the equinovalgus deformity. At, at the risk of producing a crouch. Yes, so in either way, that is going so, to be crouch. So, so, yeah, so you've got a problem. Right. Yeah, so the me mechanics by which it occurs is this. But if you lengthen the gastrosolius early, then you you have doomed to have crouch. Okay, thank you. So like, uh, if you have any question related to planar valgus foot etiology, then we can discuss at this stage. Otherwise we will go to the next uh, presentation that is by uh, KMC team, Devendra and Siddharth. Uh, they will be speaking about the femoral antiversion role in crouch. Any question? Okay, Devendra, you can start your presentation. Yeah. Devendra, any issue? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Please take it into the full screen. Yeah. Good afternoon. The topic uh, assigned to me is uh, femoral antiversion contributing to uh, the approach key. So, the normal uh, femoral antiversion is uh, 32 degrees at birth. At two years, it becomes 30 degrees, and at ad adult, it becomes uh, around 15 degrees. So, uh, this the decrease in femoral antiversion depends upon uh, the hip capsule and ligaments which exert forces on the proximal curing, uh, proximal femur during upright standing. So, upright standing and full head hip extension contribute to remodeling of the femoral antiversion in normal symptoms. So, uh, this mechanism is not there and uh, in uh, telemetry CP. So, the increased uh, femoral antiversion compromises the lever arm of hip abductors as the projection of the femoral neck length in the coronal plane is shortened. So, we can pick out the blue arrow here, the uh, left side of the picture, and uh, this is the abducted lever arm in normal uh, children. And uh, the picture to the right is the uh, lever arm in decreased. Uh, uh, increased femoral antiversion. So, the moment generated, the force generated depends upon the abductor uh, force generated depends upon the force and distance. So, here we can clearly see that the moment generated is decreased because because decrease in distance. So, the when the femoral antiversion persists, the GT is posterior to the frontal plane. So, next, the compensatory mechanism is that the by internally rotating, we uh, the, the child tries to bring the, I mean the GT to a more horizontal plane to increase the abductor lever arm. So by doing so, uh, there is a compensatory 
external extortion, external extortion develops as a compensation for this. So, if the external tibial torsion develops, uh, the lever arm of the plantar flexor is compromised. So, normally on, uh, also the plantar flexors are weak in CP and because of this mechanism, they are further weakened. So, and uh, my as my friend also uh, had, uh, regarding the foot, he, the lever arm because of, uh, of the plantar flexor is decreased because the movement is also decreased at the foot. You can see the left side and the right side compare. Uh, decreased uh, lever arm is there in the foot also. So because there is a uh, weak plantar flexion, uh, the knee, uh, knee extension is not possible because the plantar flexion and knee extension are linked by the plantar flexion knee extension. So this would lead to the characteristic uh, knee flexion and ankle dorsal flexion, which would result in the crouch gait. So, my, I would conclude by saying to restore the plantar flexure movement, we have to derotation osteotomy of the tibia and uh, or derotation osteotomy of the, uh, the femur and adequate contraction, uh, uh, correction of uh, foot deformity and correction of uh, knee uh, contracture. If there is anything, you have to uh, to restore the plantar flexion movement. All this has to be done. These are my liver, uh, my uh, references. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Devendra, for uh, explaining that. Now, my question is that in the initial part of the presentation, you said that it affects the hip abductor mechanism, and if uh, femoral antiversion is affecting the hip abductor mechanism that at the most it would lead to a waddling gait or what we call it lurch how it will affect crouch gait sir uh, you would uh, the compensatory mechanism to uh, restore the, uh, the abductor uh, moment arm by we do it by the rotation of uh, the internal rotation of the entire lower limb sir that uh, uh, the lower limb internal rotation uh, as a compensatory mechanism to that, the tibia goes into extortion. And uh, because of the, that, the lever arm, because of the tibial extortion, the lever arm of the plantar flexors is decreased. So that contributes to the weakness of uh, the plantar flexors leading to crouch gait. Okay, so uh, in corollary to that, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Benjamin Joseph, that uh, is it the mechanism that uh, femoral antiversion results into tibial extorsion over a period of time? And tibial extorsion is really causing the problem at uh, foot level by changing the biomechanics. So even, if, even if without the tibia going to a compensatory external torsion, an internally rotated foot also is biomechanically poor as far as the plantar flexor power is concerned. So if you're yes. inter if you if you internally rotate and have a intoing gait, your lever arm is affected already. So it's not mandatory that you should have an extortion to have this problem set in. An internal rotation gait in the presence of a crouch, I mean in the presence of uh, weakness of the of the anti-gravity muscles is likely to cause crouch anyway. You are right that uh, basically when there is a increased femoral antiversion, there will be a foot progression angle towards uh, internally, yeah. and that would reduce the uh, the foot function as a biomechanical point of view. Yeah. So now the question is like, if we really want to treat femoral antiversion, then we should treat it before the tibial extorsion develops. Is it the I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether it's cause and effect. I, I, I don't know. It may be. Because you do see children without that massive extortion. You see some with it. So I, I'm not sure which, why some develop it and some don't. So I'm not sure whether it's entirely cause and effect. If there is a, a tibial torsional abnormality, then I, I would correct it. Right, right, right. Okay, and uh, we will come to the management of uh, correction of femoral antiversion later part of the discussion. 
Uh, before that, uh, let's have the presentation by uh, Dr. Khatri about the tibial torso. Dr. Khatri, yeah. Good evening, sir. Yes, so I'm talking about tibial torsion and how is it involved in crouch gait. So answer to this this question in sim simpler words, the answer to this question is it's a lever arm dysfunction. Uh, most of the uh, talk, my uh, most of my uh, presentation has already been covered by preceding speakers. I'll just try to add on to the uh, what what has already been spoken. So there is a uh, in cerebral palsy there are maldirected levers which lead to faulty skeletal development and they reduce the effectiveness or change the direction of the forces. The most common faulty skeletal alignment in CP are external tibial torsion and pes pleno valgus, but they are in turn related to femoral antiversion also. So I'll be speaking briefly about femoral antiversion as well. So femoral antiversion, as uh, Devendra told, it is 32 degree at birth and, and because of the anterior capsule, uh, anterior capsular stretch on the hip joint, it becomes taut with hip extension and the femoral with hip extension and with uh, as the child uh, begins to stand, there is a stretch on the anterior uh, hip capsule and being uh, cartilaginous nature of the femoral neck, which is put under strain, the hip uh, fem uh, femoral antiversion reduces to about 30 degree by the age of two and it reaches the adult level by the age of, uh, uh, it, it reaches the adult level of 15 degree in healthy individual. But in CP, in, even in adult, it remains at around 30 degree. So what happens in CP, there is delayed onset of walking. So the femoral neck, which is cartilaginous in, in nature, that becomes, uh, they, this uh, starts ossifying. So there remains a persistent fetal malalignment. Also, the patient walks because of the flexion contractures of the hip joint, the patient starts to walk with hips in flexion. So the, the physiological stretch of the anterior capsule is lacking. And thirdly, there is already um, internal, the, 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 the internal rotators at hip are spastic in case, in case of CP. So spasticity also leads to this abnormal internal rotation stresses. So eventually the femoral antiversion develops and this, this also contributes towards external tibial torsion and pleno valgus feet. So what is the origin of tibial torsion and the crouch? What my understanding was, and of course we are adding up the knowledge. So my, what my understanding was, what I could gather from the various books is in, in our child with CP, the femoral antiversion persists. So, because of the excessive femoral antiversion, the GT becomes posterior to the frontal plane. So, the, the, uh, the first compensation comes with, with intoing. The child starts to walk with an intoing gait. But this clumsy gait is not tolerated for long. And soon the, uh, the feet turn forward. So, the secondary compensation comes from the uh, external tibial torsion and test pleno valgus. So compensatory changes, this uh, tibial extortion and pleno valgus, they also, be, uh, uh, they are, they are, these compensatory changes are also insufficient and GT somewhat remains posterior to the frontal plane. So the abduction torque of the gluteus medius is reduced and a new component of the force that is internal rotation torque is also introduced. And this aggravates the existing internal rotation of the entire upper limb. So it results in further external tibial torsion and pes pleno valgus as additional compensation. This helps the child to maintain the foot in normal progression line of walking, but but they put uh, but the uh, because of the extor the extortion leads to malrotated and the pes pleno valgus leads to a flexible lever arm dysfunction, and this contribute uh, towards crouching. So uh, now, what is the effect? of uh, tibial extortion. This was what my understanding was. This was the cause and the, the effect of tibial extortion is that the when uh, normally when the tibial torsion is normal, the 
ground reaction force remains in the sagittal plane it's a pure sagittal plane force and as we can see in in uh, in this diagram the uppermost the z axis the entire tibial uh, the entire force of plantar flexion knee extension couple come into the z axis only and there are um, practically zero uh, x l axis or uh, y axis components but when there is a increased tibial extorsion the liver arm uh, becomes short and uh, the force is uh, the the uh, fulcrum that is flexion axis of the ankle remains the same but the liver gets distorted and because of the distorted liver the plantar flexion knee extension couple does not get the sufficient force so eventually if the ground reaction force uh, 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 ground reaction force shifts completely behind the knee the external knee torque will fully be, uh, will fully become a flexion knee torque and now the crouch is invariable and the second mechanism is there is also with the uh, extorsion there is also a reduction of the muscles capacity the muscles in cp also the muscles are able to generate adequate force but they may not produce the sufficient torque because of the faulty liver so the capacity of soleus posterior gluteus medius and gluteus maximus to extend the hip and knee they reduce by 90% at, at at a torsion of 30 degree and they reduce by 70% at at a torsion of 50 degree that's what i have to submit about tibial extorsion okay thank you dr khatri for a beautiful explanation the only one point uh, which uh, i would like to say that uh, what you what? described uh, and what uh, dr benjamin said that still we are not sure about the cause effect relation so, so probably uh, like i was also under the same impression that femoral antiversion leads to tibial torsion but uh, dr benjamin said that it it may not be right it it may be right it may not be right yes sir uh, the reason why i am saying that is you take don't don't talk of cp talk of internal anti excess of femoral antiversion in an otherwise normal child what's the natural history of that what proportion they gradually of that? yeah they gradually become all right or the, or they don't some of them persist look at the ones that persist do they have a compensatory external tibial torsion only a small fraction and that is what we call desirable valenan syndrome which is a rare entity i might have seen 20 cases of excessive femoral antiversion and i might see just one case of an uh, miserable malalignment syndrome so it's not the automatic follow the you, you know an end result of an increased femoral antiversion is not necessarily an external tibial torsion because you don't see it in, in situation where it's, so in cp there's something more acting there that's why i said that it's it, it's not a must and that's why i said it's not clear okay yes yeah, so that that's a very good uh, logic that we don't see that uh, in normal population so there must be something more in cerebral palsy which is leading to this combination so yes that's basically your research area for the future because you are going to have three decades ahead in your career and you have to find out uh, why it is happening like that okay alur have you prepared on the obesity part alur has left okay fine so now we go to the alur are you there i am sir i am there sir yeah please please sir i have a question sir yeah please is the presence of adductor spasticity in cerebral palsy children uh, does that uh, play a role sir in giving the compensatory external tibial torsion okay why do you feel like that mm. So adductor spasticity uh, brings the limb more towards the coronal uh, midline, sir. Right. So that thing is different from that of normal children. Normal so, population. Yes, it could yes. be. We we can't say that it's not. But yes, e even if it is, then we need to find out the mechanism. We need to have a theory how it leads to uh, tibial extorsion. So what you said is like that is one difference. uh in cerebral palsy children okay. and the normal population so yes it could be okay okay sir thank you good 
yes abhi please yes sir yes sir i'm starting so today i'm going to speak about the effect of overweight or obesity in case of crouch gait so ch- childhood obesity has been identified as a major public health concern so it can affect long term health and well being in multiple ways the association between childhood obesity and the chronic health condition in adult life is well established in children there is a significant portion of children with report of musculoskeletal pain which can further reduce the activity of the level physical function and quality of life due to obesity and overweight so obese children are also more likely to report bullying depression and anxiety than children of altered height in in case of obese and uh, overweight children the, that is a altered gait pattern that has been obse- uh, that has been observed in adults and children who are obese so the recent systematic review reported strong evidence that children who are overweight or obese walk with greater pelvic rotation and hip in interlocution also uh, have altered movements and power generation absorption pattern in the hip knee and ankle so there is a moderate evidence that they walk with a greater step width and a long stance phase than their healthy weight peers so reduced postural stability and control has been observed in children that are obese so suggested that ex- uh, it has been suggested by that exceeds body mass requires the muscle to generate greater torque in order to maintain stability and facilitate forward progression so uh, while it appears uh, while it appears that normal children can up, adapt uh, can able to adapt to increase weight by using their muscle force effectively and increasing their muscle strength over time but in case of children with cp have weaker muscles and may therefore have a mo- more difficulty coping with additional load and less ability to adapt the increase in the weight children with cp may experience a deterioration in walking ability during adolescence that has been attributed to the less favorable mass to strength ratio increase in the body mass after the pubertal growth pubertal growth is a sudden increase in the weight but makes it more difficult for the muscles to support the body in the upright stance so this unfavorable mass to strength ratio that is a weaker muscle can no longer support the toes walking pattern due to the toe walking pattern due to the sudden increase in the weight so for similar reason it is often assumed that excessive adiposity could compound hello hello, yes, hello? Uh, so it, it is often assumed that excessive adiposity could compound walking difficulty in children with cp in particular it could predispose them to crouch gait due to greater muscle workload required to extend the hip and the knee in case of stance so despite this assumption only one study documenting the impact of additional weight on mobility and gait in children with cp while the study provides a insight into the difficulties in children with cp have in adaptation to the sudden weight gain so usually all the patient will be having a gradual weight gain during that period the muscle will uh, try to cope up but in this study they are trying to put a uh, 10% they are trying to put a 10% of the weight and comparing the uh, gait analysis in uh, normal population and the child with cp population so it does not account for the adaptation that may occur with a more gradual increase in the weight so this is the study uh, uh, which which uh, we are talking about so uh, tdc uh, that is a typically developed children seems to able to successfully handle the extra 10% of the weight but in case of cp children they experience difficulty to walk with the increased demands so uh, typically developing children walk with larger range of motion and higher movements and powers in response to the added weight in fact it appears that tdc even overcompensated for the extra weight as their resulting gait was faster and more dynamic so it has been reflected in the increase in kinematics so cp children walk slower with smaller step length and ranges of joint motion and decrease movements and powers so further while while, while uh, typically the eeg amplitude of the gastrocnemius muscle increased as a result of the added weight in cp the eemg amplitude slightly decreased so basically to increase the force output a muscle can apply two strategies one is either one motor unit is either more motor units recruited or the activity of the already recruited motor units is synchronized nicely so that the amplitude will increase so the first strategy will increase both the emg frequency and amplitude while the latter strategy the emg frequency will not be increasing but the amplitude will be increased as the emg amplitude slightly decreased in cp it appears at cp the muscle failed to successfully increase their force output during the uh, weighted walking 
This finding is supported by the conclusion in the study of uh, Dalmajer et al. in 2012, who found that lower limb muscles of CP are characterized by a small muscle reserve during the walking. So previous research already provided an indication that weight could have a negative impact on the gait portion CP, specifically the sudden increase in the body weight during the, uh, they, are, uh, they are trying to tell that this 10% of the sudden increase in the body weight will be seen in the pre-pubertal growth spurt has been previously related to the more rapid development of the grouch later in the CP, in case of CP, it is in gauge 2004 paper. So this rapid development was suggested to be related to the increased body mass within the CP children's. So this is an another article which is published in 2021. In this, the effect of being overweight on the morbidity, temporal spatial kinematics in children. In this one, they are doing a 3D gait analysis uh, in the CP child's. Uh, according to the GMFCS, they are trying to uh, correlate with the obesity and the gait pattern, abnorm gait pattern abnormalities. They, they, are not, they are not comparing this. Uh, in the previous study, they are comparing with the uh, well child. But here, they are uh, uh, grouping the patients in the, according to the GMFCS page, and they are uh, uh, seeing whether is there any uh, changes in the obesity, BMI. They found that little evidence that a BMI was associated with increased gait abnormalities in the children's CP. Children's classified as overweight or obese has reduced peak hip extension and increased ankle dorsiflexion in the stands compared with the children's of the heavy weight. But this, uh, but this is very minimal. Uh, but this is very minimal uh, ratio. However, they did not find the high BMI was associated with a similar increase in the knee flexion during the stance phase. Once the GM of CS level and age were accounted for, once the GM of CS level and age were accounted, they did not find a high BMI was associated with a similar increase in the P flexion. Children with CP have very varying movement problems relating to both primary and secondary effect of CP, which are more clinically important than BMI in influencing gait kinematics. So they are also found that uh, most of the patients with overweight, they are not walking up to, they are not walk, they are not achieving the 500 meters suggesting that being obese may pose greater limitation to the ability to walk for longer distance, but not in the shorter distance in case of 3D gait analysis. Therefore, uh, 3D gait analysis may not be a best tool to measure the impact of increased BMI case, and it is conducted over short distance, and it is a laboratory setting. So more functionally challenging tasks such as six-minute walk tests may be more able to quantify this impact. So that's it, sir. Yeah. Alur, wonderful. Yes, sir. Really Thank like you, sir. you emphasize the point uh, about the obesity. And obesity is really becoming a big problem for our society. It's more uh, prevalent in the Western society, but uh, equally uh, becoming um, like common in our society. So uh, I, I would like to have uh, Dr. Benjamin's opinion because in last 30 years, you have ch seen the change in the weight which has taken place. And what are the effects uh, Yes, that, there, ha that, there, ha there has been an increase in weight, but fortunately, even now, we don't see a large proportion of obese children. May maybe it's worse in Gujarat because you're a much richer state. So afflu affluence, ghee, amur ghee, and everything might uh, contribute to it. But yes, definitely the, the, the weight has increased or if you take normal values. But we I, I don't recall... Uh, any specific child with severe obesity uh, among the CP population. So we're fortunate. <coughs> I think we're lucky. Uh, see, uh, obesity can definitely could make walking much more difficult, and so it's, it's better to avoid it. But we don't see a lot of it. Okay, uh, like if I uh, share my, again, like say, I would say that this is not the statistically, you can't say from uh, uh, one or two cases. But like the cases where I have not got a good result after crowd surgery, one of the factor is obesity. So I consider that as a very uh, important factor in decision making. Maybe because I have not uh, got a result and that negative result may have a lot of impact on my mind. But I consider obesity as one of the negative factors as far as the results are concerned. And uh, Alu tried to describe uh, the scientific reasons for that. So, yes, we have to take that as a very important thing. And we have probably seen the same thing in spina bifida also. In spina a, bifida is a different issue. It's Obviously, a different it's issue, but uh, weakness part is 
is, so is there. It's exceedingly common by nature of the disease process itself. So in spinal of the field, obesity is exceedingly common, but we don't see it so much so in CP. I don't know why. Yes, again, so uh, fellows, this is going to be a challenge for you and try to find out uh, these questions which are not yet answered by the current literature. So, so maybe, we have, yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe the spastic muscles burn more energy. They spend more energy and so, so burn off the fat. That's probably one thing that you notice. Yes, could be. That could be one of the reasons that uh, compared to that. The another thing which I consider that, uh, again, this is a hypothesis. What we see in polio, the post-polio syndrome, like after uh, fifth decade, some of the polio patients, they have additional weakness. Yeah. So something can be uh, playing role in cerebral palsy also because they have a weak muscles to begin with and relatively more load may be responsible for such changes. We don't know whether that's right or wrong or what is actually happening uh, in a long run over mus in the muscle, but these are the possibilities. Fine. So uh, we uh, understood the four important factors. There are a few factors which are remaining and we will discuss those factors also uh, in, in nutshell. So I, I will try to share some of the causes of crouch. So one of the factor, I hope you are able to see my presentation. Yeah. 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 So one of the factor which is responsible is a soleus weakness. We all understood about planovalgus foot, tibial torsion leading to liverum problem and it affects the soleus function. But one of the important factor is soleus muscle itself is weak. There are various reasons for that. The first is neurological factor. All cerebral palsy children have uh, weak muscles. So that is first possibility. The second factor which I always blame and I always uh, tell in my presentations that a repeated or continuous use of AFO reduce the ankle movement and that may be one of the factor which leads to soleus weakness. Again, I don't have a scientific proof, but that's a possibility. The botulinum injection has been proved beyond doubt that repeated botulinum injection leads to muscle fibrosis and leads to weakness. The same thing happened in soleus also. A repeated injections of botulinum may be responsible for soleus weakness. Already last time we saw that in diaplegic tendoachylis surgery or a vulpius may lead to weakening of the soleus by unnecessary lengthening of the soleus. So these are the reasons for soleus weakness. Then there is additional factor, which is a positional liver arm disorders or the dysfunction for soleus. So let me explain you this. When we are upright, the black dot is the center of the ankle. And if we look at the soleus, then this is what the liver arm for the soleus muscle. So green horizontal line is the length of the liver arm. Now, in the same person, when there is crouch, there is a dorsiflexion at the ankle, and that leads to this much amount as a lever arm. So now, if you compare the previous figure and this figure, you can see that there is a reduction in the lever arm only just by changing the position. So because now ankle is in dorsiflexion, that leads to positional liver arm dysfunction of the soleus. Soleus is already weak and because of its position, the new position, it has become functionally more weaker. So the point which I would like to emphasize is that ankle dorsiflexion reduces liver arm. This is irrespective of the muscle power generating ability. It's just the position of the ankle which is responsible for this problem. Then already we have discussed about the long quadriceps, but again, we would like to understand uh, this point because there are few important questions which are not answered at present. 
and we need to find out answers for those questions. So we will discuss that also. So let's understand long quadricep. We have seen in many children with crouch that there is a patella alta and there is elongation of the patella tendon. So if this is a normal child who is having a normal length of the patella tendon, the knee is flexed to 90 degree. And when we ask to carry out extension, the full knee extension takes place. There is no extension leg. However, when there is a patella alta, because of the elongation of the patellar tendon, when the same child tries to carry out knee extension, the full knee extension is not possible and that results into extension leg. Now, why this is important? When this child like this on an examination table, there is an extension leg and the same child adopts a upright posture like this, it results into a knee flexion gait because quadricep does not have adequate uh, strength because of the elongation of the patellar tendon to carry out last few degree of extension. And that results into a knee flexion and that leads to crouch gait. So this is very common that elongation of the patellar tendon leads to this problem. These questions are difficult questions and I want uh, Dr. Benjamin to answer those questions because I, I don't have answers to those questions. So the first question is that why does quadriceps muscle elongate? That's the first question. Once there is weakness, we, we, we define that the ability to stand straight is because of the strength of the anti-gravity muscles. Once there is weakness of any component, be it the soleus, the quadriceps, or the glutei, and you start getting weakness, you will begin to collapse. And when you begin to collapse, the first thing that happens is flexion of the hip, flexion of the knee, also flexion of the ankle. And in that position, if you continue to hold it in that position, the quadriceps necessarily is put on stretch. And that's the muscle that tries hardest to straighten out the knee because that is the muscle that's acting on the knee. And it keeps on contracting, contracting, trying to overcome the problem that has started. And it just makes it worse because the muscle gets elongated and the patella gets pulled up. So it's, 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 it's a phenomenon that occurs over time. And it's inevitable if left alone. And therefore, and as you said rightly, it's probably the most important aspect of crouch that needs to be addressed. Right. So this is one area because uh, what Dr. Benjamin said is the mechanism which is taking place. But if we go beyond and start thinking that if we want to prevent that, we will be coming to that question, how we can prevent that? Because that is, again, a very important thing. So when we look at uh, muscle, or like the, when we say that the quadriceps elongate, there are two possibilities. The one is the problem takes place at the infrapatellar area as shown in this. We all are now clear about it. We all have uh, evidence to see it because we have an X-ray and X-ray shows a high riding patella. And indirectly we get the idea that there is an elongation of the patellar tendon. There is a second possibility that this problem may take place at the suprapatellar level also. In addition to infrapatellar, where we are definitely there, there is a possibility that the whole quadricep which is stretched, there is a problem at the suprapatellar level also. So we know that for the evaluation of infrapatellar elongation, that's patella alta, we have a clinical method where we try to look at the inferior pole of the patella and how much away it is or how much up it is from the joint line. There is a clinical method or we have a radiological ways by which we measure the patella alta. Now, I would like to ask you uh, for the measurement of the patella alta, there are various uh, techniques described. So which one is a favorite technique which you follow? So now this is a question for the fellows. At your institute, 
which technique you follow to measure the patellar height or the patellar tendon uh, length. Oshino is one method. Insal Salvat is another method. Yeah, because which we method? We use the Koshino index, sir, in pediatric. Koshino index. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Can someone tell me what is a method at uh, uh, AMC, Kasturba Medical, Medical College, Manipal? We can check it clinically at the, well, checking the inferior pole at the level of the adductor tubercle. Uh, clinically, we can check it like that as well, along with the other indices on the X-ray. Yeah, but like say, if you are going for a surgical treatment, then uh, to compare the pre and the post, we need some radiological measurement. Otherwise, we cannot tell what is the change in the by, by the patella position after surgery. So for that, which method you use? Insal Salvati uh, index. Insal Salvati. Okay, good. And Dr. Khatri or Dr. Akash, what do you use at uh, your center? I use the Insal Salvati index. Okay, right. Good. So now I would like to ask uh, Dr. Benjamin that uh, of the two or three popular method, which one do you recommend and which one is good? I, I would be the... most comfortable with the Insal Salvati because you can actually do that clinically as well. If you can measure the height of the patella and the distance between the lower pole and the tibial tuberosity. So clinically also, you can use exactly the same thing. So that's why I was always fascinated with the insert salvat. But uh, we do know from experience that when we try to write something about crouch, the reviewers always wanted the Cushino, the Cushino index for some strange reason. So I, I'm not sure what the advantage is, but because there are two different ways of measuring the same thing. So I've used the insert salvati, maybe now because of compunctions, because of uh, reviewers, Hitesh may be changing on to the Koshino, I'm not too sure about it. Okay, good. So let's move on to the, a slightly difficult thing. See, in the case of infrapatellar elongation, we can measure it by X-ray. So definitely it's easy for us to understand that. When it comes to suprapatellar elongation, the question is, the first question is, does it occur? So Benjamin, what is your uh, opinion on that? What I said is just a hypothesis. It, it may not be true, but do you think that it can happen? The patella won't go up if there's lengthening suprapatella. It has to be a shortening at the suprapatella. Yes, okay. So you think that when infrapatellar uh, lengthening takes place, the suprapatellar portion should be short? Yes. If you, if you if it's just like any length, tendon you lengthen, the muscle belly will, will necessarily be, become shorter. Okay. So you think that uh, there is an infrapatellar elongation and suprapatellar shortening? Which and and which again is counterproductive because the strength of a muscle is, is proportional to the, the resting length. And if you if you lost a resting length, you've got a, even weaker quadriceps. So it's it's a vicious cycle. Okay, good. The question is that uh, because we don't have anything to measure and um, one of the management guru said that the things which you cannot measure, you can't understand. The Peter Drucker said that, but that's for the management thing that uh, if you really want to understand something, you need to measure it. Uh, do you have any idea how to measure the suprapatellar uh, portion evaluation? Mm. If you take orange into insertion, that length itself is, is what we're talking about, isn't it? But how, how do we measure it? By X-ray, by ultrasound, what should be the method of measuring it? Could be with the standing X-ray, so because that, that is when the quadriceps is really functioning. Right. So if I take a lateral view, then that if I'm really keen to see the length of the quadriceps mechanism, I would use that patella to maybe anterior superior leg spine or anterior inferior leg spine and uh, patella to tibial tuberosity. Okay, right. Fine. Uh, so already we discussed the, this point that these are the ways by which we can evaluate. But again, uh, quadriceps has a two portion, the biarticular and the uh, monoarticular. So the technique which you describe will be mainly for the 
by articular the rectus which is originating from the ASIS. Yes. yes. Yeah. The monoarticular portion vasti cannot be evaluated by this method. Yeah. I, I accept that. Okay. And then coming to the most important thing is like how can we prevent elongation of quadriceps mechanism? When I say quadriceps, it includes both muscle and tendon unit. So what can we do to prevent it? For one, if you can keep the strength of the quadriceps going, you might minimize this problem. So if you intense, get intensive quadriceps strengthening exercises in the young child is probably something that might help. I can't think of any other definite way to prevent it. Right, so that's another area where we need to find out that why quadricep or the patellar tendon is elongated over a period of time. And what can we do to prevent that elongation? Because if we can find out the mechanism, then probably we can avoid one problem developing. We started off by saying the crouch is because of weakness of your anti-gravity muscles. So strengthen the anti-gravity muscles. If you strengthen them and they remain strong, then the crouch may be a little slower in onset. And consequently, the lengthening of the patellar tendon also will be delayed. So I think intensive quadricep strengthening is an important thing that we must think of. Good. So then coming to our one controversial point is about the hamstring length. The question is, are hamstrings always short in crouch? No. The simple answer is no. In which cases there is, uh, they are short and in, in which cases they are long? In majority of instances, they are short. Right, because there are a few studies where they have measured the hamstring length with the software uh, after the gait analysis has been done, the three uh, dimensional or the computer gait analysis is done. And in which they have identified that not all the children with crouch have a short hamstrings. Yeah, I'm aware of that. Yeah. So uh, one thing which has been realized that uh, forget about the length of the hamstrings, which is not always, they are not always short. In some cases they are, in some cases they are not. But there is one factor which is there that is positional lever arm dysfunction of the hamstrings. We understood the mechanism for the soleus. The same thing happens in a different way for hamstrings. Let's say that this is an upright posture and uh, the black dot is the center of the knee joint and the blue is the hamstrings. This is what the lever arm, the distance from that. And now you can see with the crouch, the distance of the hamstrings from the center of the knee increases. And that increases the lever arm of the hamstring, which will produce more flexor moment and which will lead to more knee flexion. So this is, completely opposite to what we see in the, uh, what we saw in the case of soleus. Here, because of the position, the hamstrings lever arm increase and that has a more tendency for knee flexion. So the point is that knee flexion increases the lever arm of hamstrings. Another important factor is like the fixed flexion deformity at the knee joint. Many children um, with cerebral palsy, they have a fixed flexion deformity at the knee joint. And when person has a knee flexion deformity, there are two possibilities. Either they stand with a heel up or they stand with the heel touching the floor. And as we discussed that uh, most of the children over a period of time, when their heel is up, either they will develop heel valgus, midfoot break, or their soleus will be stretched out and that will lead to uh, ankle dorsiflexion. So knee flexion deformity is one of the important factors which leads to crouch gait. Again, when it comes to development of knee flexion deformity, we don't know what is the reason and why it is developing, whether it's because of the short hamstrings, whether it's because of the, uh, like the position, because while walking their knee remain flexed, and because of that, they develop flexion deformity. Still, we don't know the cause of it, but 
we definitely see many children with uh, having a knee flexion deformity. I just would like to suggest you to read about a chapter in the Freeman's latest book, a chapter 107 by Reinhard Brunner. And in that chapter, he has described various other factors, the, some of the factors which we saw, but there are other factors also which are responsible for crouch gate. And according to Reinhard Brunner, the balance problem is one of them. The sensory issues, which is very prevalent in children with cerebral palsy, is one of the reasons. And the hip extensor weakness could be the another mechanism. So these are the factors which are responsible for various reasons for uh, crouch gait. Now, before we move on to the another topic, about the ill effects of the crouch, I would like to ask you if you have any question related to the etiology or cause, you can ask at this stage. Any question? Fine, let's go on to the ill effects of the crouch. Okay, so there are four or five ill effects of the crouch gate. This is very important because when it comes to correction, the first question which will be asked in exam that why you want to correct crouch gate. It's not the appearance, but it is something else which is responsible for that. And for that, the first thing is like it increases the quadriceps demand. How I understand or how we understand that Let's see that in the stance phase, particularly in the mid stance, when the knee can be extended fully, the ground reaction force passes in front of the knee joint. And this will lead to a extensor moment at the knee joint and knee can remain straight or upright without any muscle activity, only with the help of a posterior capsule. When the same knee is um, like say 20 degree flex, the ground reaction force is now behind the center of the knee joint. So previously it was producing the extensor moment, but now it is behind the knee joint, it produces the flexor moment and that causes knee to flex. Now, if we want to avoid or if we want to remain upright, in that case, the person has to use quadricep muscle. With further increase in the crouch, let's say that now knee remains in 40 degree flexion. With that, the ground reaction force moves further posteriorly away from the center of the knee joint. And you can see the distance of ground reaction force with the center of the knee joint. And with the 40 degree knee flexion that has increased and that produces more flexor moment and to remain upright, we need even more powerful quadriceps. So if you look at from normal to 20 degree to 40 degree, in the zero degree, we don't need quadriceps. With 20 degree, we need some quadriceps activity. With 40 degree, we need quite a large amount of quadriceps activity. So what I see is this is like, uh, if there is a, this is a porter at the railway station, usually they are carrying one bag but the situation of quadricep in the crouch gate is something like that. They are really overloaded. They have to work hard. The second thing is like the prolonged quadriceps action. In a normal person, if we look at in a stance phase and a swing phase, the quadricep is eccentrically working in the beginning of the stance. And then it's concentrically working in the early stance phase. This is the only period where the quadriceps is active. In crouch gait, because of the knee flexion, it has to remain active all throughout the stance phase. And if you look at this video, it will show you, look at the quadricep muscles. Look at the bulk of the quadricep muscle.
So I consider this as a situation of a resident. Many of you are working very long and that affects your functioning. The similarly in Crouch, the quadricep works very long all throughout the stand space and that results into early fatigue. And because of that, these patients, they walk very little distance. The third factor is it increases the loading on patellofemoral joint. If we look at the loading on the patellofemoral joint, if you want to calculate, this is how we look at the two core section. The one is in the patellar tendon direction, the other is in the quadricep direction. And parallelogram, if we draw, that determines the force on the patellofemoral joint or the patella forcing at the, on the trochlea. With knee flexion, this knee is now flexed. Nothing has changed. Only thing is like the quadricep force has increased and the direction is changed. And that results into a completely different parallelogram. And that leads to more patellofemoral joint pain. And uh, that leads to increased loading and over a period of time, uh, some changes in the patellar, uh, articular surface of the patella, or we see the stress effect at a various insertion point. So this crouch leads to pain or ouch at the patellofemoral joint. And some of the changes which we see are because of the increased loading, which we already discussed, that leads to like uh, if you look at, there is a fracture at the inferior pole of the patella. That is one change. Sometimes you see a major piece of the inferior pole getting separated because of the excessive loading. So these are the effects of the crouch gait. So in nutshell, these are the four important biomechanical effects which leads to problem in the patient. Then there is another mechanism which is controversial. So I have shown in a red color. And why it is controversial that I will describe. I used to believe that uh, when this is the normal situation, this is what the lever arm for the quadricep mechanism or for patella. Now in the case of patella alta, the patella is at higher level and that leads to reduction in the lever arm of the quadricep mechanism. And because now lever arm is reduced to compensate quadricep has to work more or it will not be able to function properly. And that will be again, setting up a vicious cycle. So just to comparison with patella alta, without patella alta, we can see that there is a change in the lever arm. So I used to believe that patella alta reduces lever arm of quadriceps. At one of the meeting, um, at uh, one of the POSICON, I shared this presentation and Tom Novacek, who worked with Jim Gage, and he said that Diren, this is not right. The reason what he said is that patella alta is bad for a person when he's upright, but it is favorable for the person who is in a crouch, the patella alta is favorable because it improves the quadricep lever arm mechanism. I, I cannot understand that, but I would request uh, Dr. Benjamin, can you explain me this point, what Tom Novacek is trying to say? I, I don't know. I agree with you entirely. Okay, my, good. So, so I, 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 re I really can't understand why he says Okay, so I need to again ask the reason why he said so. Uh, and he said that uh, patella alta is better for uh, crouch gait. I, I don't know, but I will try to gather that information from the clear, Clearly, when there is patella alta, the quadriceps is weak. So it just cannot be better for them. And if, yes. I, if, I may, if I may also add one thing, one of the adverse effects of crouch gait is that it grossly increases the energy consumption evaluation. Uh, exactly. So that is what like we saw that uh, all throughout the stand space, the quadricep has to work. So you, you, you can measure the energy consumption when a child walks on normal ground. And see a CP child, it's much, much higher. And if you look at the different abnormal gait patterns, the gait pattern which has got the highest energy consumption 
is a crouch gate. And yes, they, I think you have a very good paper uh, with that uh, physiotherapist. I forgot the name. Yeah. The physiological cost index in general of pediatric orthopedic. Exactly. Exactly. Kavita Raja. Kavita, that's right. And that's what in that we showed that this is the worst gate pattern. And what is the effect of excessive energy consumption? When we say we are tired, we have exhausted our energy. So the child walks less. So the function is less. So it, it is a terrible situation. So I think crouch is something that really needs to be tackled early and tackled well. We are coming to that question when it should be tackled. <laughs> we are coming to that question. Uh, before that, I would uh, like uh, our fellows to uh, remember about the next program of POSI. That's a current concept in Parthi's disease. Uh, this program is uh, a combination with, or like we are doing jointly with Egyptian Orthopedic Society. And that is on the 9th September from 9 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. We have three experts from uh, India as well as Egypt. We have Dr. Benjamin Joseph, we have Anil Agrawal, and we have Mandar Agase from India. And we have Dr. Exi, Dr. Hosni, and Dr. El Barbari uh, from Egypt. And we are going to cover almost everything which is uh, important for the Perthes disease in this program. So you can definitely watch that. One more thing that, uh, especially for you on the 22nd September, uh, we have invited Peter Stevens. Peter Stevens is a person who innovated eight plate and uh, he will be with us from 8.30 p.m. Indian time for an hour and you can have dialogues with him. So I request you to send your questions beforehand so that we can put them in order and then we can discuss all these questions. So we have a few minutes with us before we end and at, in, in these few minutes, we will discuss important question. The first question is about the natural history of crouch gate. Um, Dr. Benjamin, can you tell us about the natural history of crouch gate? Because it's very important for any gait disorders to understand what happens over a period of time. Yeah, again, very simply, it's a progressive phenomenon. So initially you have crouch without petal alter, without a flexion deformity, but when the child is walking, the, dynamically there is a crouch. And that is predominantly due to spasticity and weakness. And as this goes on, you start getting the petla alter kicking in. And then as that continues at a point of time, you start getting a flexion deformity. So the treatment will vary depending on whether it is initial, without deformity, with, without petal alter, or you come to the next stage where there is petal alter, but no fixed deformity. And you come to the third stage where you've got petal alter, weakness, and uh, flexion deformity. Okay, so uh, one thing is very clear that it's a progressive condition. How fast the gait will deteriorate, that is not uh, known. There are many factors responsible for that. So do you have any idea like how we can predict that this child is going to deteriorate very fast? I don't think that they deteriorate that fast. I'm sure the crouch can continue, but I don't think they develop contractures at, at very early. So most of them, are, it's, it's a slightly slow process and it's by the time they get into adolescence, 12 years or more, that the majority of your crouch you deal with. You do see some younger children, but the majority are around 12 and above. So uh, like one of the problem which we see in our practice is like they say that we want to wait. So what is your answer to that uh, wait period? When they say that we want to wait for six months, we want to do physiotherapy, we want to try this and that. So what is your answer to that? To be honest, it's not too bad an idea. Because the, when, when we do a definitive correction, it doesn't matter too much whether they are 14 or whether they are 12. So, okay, I, I so yeah, so you would like to wait. Uh, if they want to wait, they, we can definitely yeah, wait. I, I, I do let them wait. Right. But let's take a situation where a girl who is already 14, she has completed the growth. And if they want to wait, what, is, what will be your answer to that? 
again, I, you know, I, I don't think it would be terribly bad if they, they, they wait a little longer. But I tell them that now is the optimum time before it becomes too, too long and then she can't rehabilitate herself properly, then it becomes a problem. So I would tell them that maybe 12 to 14 is probably the best time. Uh, I just would like to give you a one practical tip to the fellows that what I suggest to the patient, which was initially it was very difficult and I used to take video on their behalf, but now almost every mobile has a video camera and I ask them to take the video from side at every three to six months. And the advantage of that is in three months, six months, they are not going to see change, but if the gate is deteriorating over a period of time, that video recording becomes a very important tool for them to understand that, yes, the gate is deteriorating. Yeah. As Dr. Benjamin said that the deterioration is so slow that it's very difficult for anyone to understand that or remember that. But video recording is one of the thing which helps. The second thing I suggest them to measure a distance which child can walk, say like 500 uh, meter, 600 meter, and at the same time, the speed. So what is a walking speed? So this is also very helpful to understand that whether the deterioration is taking place. So these are simple ways and it becomes a powerful tool, particularly when parents observe that gait is deteriorating. Now coming to another important question from practice. There are two questions uh, you can answer. Benjamin, you can answer both the questions together or you can answer one by one. At what age you would like to go for surgery? That's the first question. And the second question is at what particular indication you say that now you have to go for surgery? Once they develop a flexion contracture, I say that they must go for surgery. Because it becomes more difficult to correct if, if you leave that and becomes extremely tight, then it becomes more of a problem. So if I see the if, uh, uh, flexion deformity set, setting and I say, now is the time to do it, otherwise it will become difficult. So that is about the flexion deformity. That's on the clinical examination. Yeah. What about the age? Age around, I said 12 to 14 is probably the, the, the limit that I would like. But we have operated on older children as well and got fairly good results because that's the first time they've come to us. Yes, so that is also another important thing that if patient comes to us at right age, yes, we need to operate uh, like say 12 to 14 or 14 to 16 in the case of boys. But even a 25 year old person, I have operated and they have also improved. Yeah. So uh, like there is no late age by which we can say that now, now this is not the time where we uh, should not operate. It's not like that. Uh, we don't know like the late age probably reduces the result uh, which we are getting, but definitely it gives result. So late age is not the issue in our country. The reason is because a lot of um, adults, they are coming to us with crouch gate. I have treated patients of uh, 25 years age also coming for the first time to orthopedic surgeon for treatment. I'm sure Dr. Benjamin also have got the similar. I'd be a little more cautious at 2025. I mean, warn them that the results may not be perfect. It may not be wonderful. But if, they, if they're willing to take the, the chance and willing to do the physiotherapy after that, then yeah, I don't think it's, it's impossible. Okay. Uh, now coming to a few uh, important practical questions. I think we will be able to cover one or two uh, questions related to flexion deformity. For flexion deformity, there are three options with us. One is we carry out a hamstring lengthening. The second is we carry out a femoral shortening. The third is uh, we do a femoral shortening with extension or only extension. And the fourth option is growth modulation. So which one do you use when? Growth modulation clearly can only be done for the very young child, maybe eight ten, to 10 years. If you find a crouch developing in a young child, growth modulation. Otherwise, there's really no role for growth modulation. Okay. Second, uh, and about growth mod modulation, I'd also say that I don't like the eight plate in the anterior part of the knee. I find that difficult. I prefer the metasaur technique if it's possible. Then when it comes to 
uh, whether I'll shorten the femur or do an extension osteotomy, without doubt, I'm convinced that I'll shorten the femur. Right? So in that case, you don't go for additional hamstring release because already femoral shortening will do a secondary lengthening. That's correct. So, I, But I would also take the semitendinosus out to transfer it. Yeah, that's just a transfer, but not not any surgery no, on the hamstrings. Not not as a as an attempt to to to, to lengthen it. No. Right. So, so that's but, about the shortening. But if yes. they if they are eighteen years old, then you'll have to release the do epineurotic release of the semimembranosus and and the biceps sometimes to get the knee straight. Otherwise, no. Yeah, I never do a capsule. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. And I let you know one important feature. When we shorten and do the protocol that we followed, we see an increase in the range of movement. It's not that the arc is improved. The actual absolute range of movement actually increases. And that I've never seen reported anywhere else. That could be because of the hamstring release, indirect hamstring release, which takes place and which is not allowing the uh, knee extension because now they are uh, relatively lax. The more knee extension is possible. Yeah, it could. Uh, that alone does seem to account for it because the knee flexion and extension seem to improve. So you've got an excellent range of movement without having to touch the capsule. Yeah. Okay. And then. Um, the another question is about the patellar plication. When do you add patellar plication? In all the patient or only in some patient? Whenever the patella is high, I do a patellar plication. Okay, so you rely on insul salvati index yeah. uh, preoperatively. If it's not more, you don't uh, carry yeah, out. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but the fact remains that virtually all the crouches that come in for surgery, there is some degree of patellar. Yes. So, yes, I, I, I do the patellar tendon shortening, which is uh, some technique of plication. I don't do a transfer. The, one of the question or the answer you gave, but I would like to ask more. We know that uh, when there is a flexion deformity, it's because of the capsular contracture and the right not, not, not surgery. Necessary. Not, not necessary. Not, because of the hamstring and the capsular contracture. Yeah. 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 So whatever is remain after the hamstring lengthening or femoral shortening is because of the capsular contracture. Now, ideally, we should correct it at the point of deformity. Yeah. Instead of that, we are doing a compensatory extension in a supracondylar area. Why do we do that? Yeah, let me tell you that the, re the situations where we do combine an extension with the, with the shortening is very, very infrequent. So that's what I'm telling you. You do the shortening. You get the knee perfectly straight. So that tells you that there isn't a, a capsular contraction. So the reason for the, the effect in deformity is essentially the hamstring being tight, not the capsule, because we hardly ever have to deal with a residual flexion deformity. The rare occasion when you've got a severe flexion deformity, which, is not, which has been there for a long time, you shorten it and you find some residual deflection deformity, we may tilt the distal fragment. Otherwise, we put the plate straight. The vast majority of instances. Okay, and the last question is about uh, when you take out a uh, three centimeter of femur, what happens to the suprapatellar muscle? The cordyceps yeah, muscles. You get the, the impression that it will weaken it, but you'd be absolutely surprised when you, I'm, and I put a cast. Now, the, the Western world thinks that I'm, I'm a stupid man for putting a cast in CP. But I've not seen any adverse effect. You put off the, take the cast off and put, send them to physio. Within two days, you find fantastic knee extension. No extensor lag. So obviously, the muscle is functioning well. And you showed a beautiful video of that boy walking with the quadriceps really hypertrophied in his crouch. Probably that's what helps us. That muscle is ready for action. And once you get the knee straight, that's it. You've got a fantastic knee extensor power. And we measured the extensor power with dynamometry and demonstrated that the power increases. 
Okay, so with that, uh, we end the session. We have already uh, reached the time limit of uh, 6.30. So first of all, I should like to thank uh, Professor Benjamin Joseph, Professor Freeman Miller, because he was traveling today uh, to out of station, he could not join us. He initially said that I will be uh, trying to log in from the airport, but unfortunately uh, he's not able to join us. So thank you very much for sparing your time for seven consecutive Tuesday. And it was really a great learning experience for me and I'm sure for fellows also. So my sincere gratitude to both of you. Thank you so much. And, thank you very uh, much, sir. And thank you very thank much. You, uh, we will take a short break. And again, we will continue uh, with whatever remain uh, topics which has remained. That is about the foot correction, about the hip correction. Uh, I will let you know when we will have a further meeting. But please remember that we have already a next meeting uh, with Peter Stevens on the 22nd of September. So uh, I will send you the link for that meeting. Thank you once again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you, everyone. You've taken a lot of effort. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Diran Bhai.